My name is Mauro Becerra. I'm the uh, CEO of the museum. And it's our pleasure and honor to host this uh, tonight's book launch. Um, before I proceed, uh, before we proceed, I should acknowledge and uh, will acknowledge our place. We sit on the ancestral village of Sanak in the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Accused Nations. That's super important for us. So when this opportunity came up, uh, it just made a lot of sense to host this activity here. In fact, it's quite a special opportunity for us. And you'll note uh, our indigenous curator, Sharon Fortney, um, brought out some pieces, belongings uh, connected to the family, uh, which are in the community gallery. So we thought it was really uh, a natural fit for us. Um, I want to, before we start the formal program, I need to thank a few people. Um, and first of all, I'd like to start with Patricia Massey, Jackie uh, Hopper, and Dr. Alex Shields of the Massey Art Society for partnering with the museum and bringing the event here. Uh, very special for us, and uh, I know they've done a lot of work um, in uh, prepping this, uh, this event. Um, also, I uh, just want to say, um, I wanted to introduce a few more people before we get to the formal event. There'll be a procession and a, and a whole uh, program that'll be more interesting than me. Um, anyway, I'd like to just um, um, introduce and thank the Matthias family, uh, Chief Ian Campbell of the Squamish Nation, who is en route, um, Cody and William Matthias, and then um, Clough Bay, the master carver from Squamish. Uh, Aggie, Rose, Katie, Mandy, Florence, Dulce, Ellen, and all the nieces and nephews. And so there's a whole um, group of, uh, of Matthias family here to celebrate what is a really uh, huge moment for quite an epic book to be kind of retold and reintegrated and, and um, really a, a kind of special new edition that I think is a, a huge opportunity for people to learn about the legends of Capilano. And I read the first one and, you know, it's amazing. So I'm looking forward to um, reading those five additional stories that I know were um, brought through the family and integrated into this piece of literature. So without further ado, I want to introduce the Matthias family and let them tell their story.
welcome. Welcome everybody on the territory of uh, Slayer Truth, Moscow, and Skohomish. Thank you very much. It's a great honor. Uh, it's a with the family and this great book we're having, The New Legends of Capilano. We're the descendants of Mary Agnes Capilano, Lake Hula. We have our ancestral name is Mines Stowako, which a chief gave me that name, which I earned across the water at Capilano River on our fishing day. That's where uh, North Shore News took a picture of me catching a fish. And I was like one inch on top of the water, just a perfect shot. And so that's how I got my ancestral name, what is the chief gave me. The chief was uh, my, also my brother, Chuck O'Connor. His English name was Chief Joe Matthias. And we have that here. And I have my uh, younger sister who's carrying, carrying her, her name, Leipula. And uh, I have our niece and our great niece sharing that her name too. And they could not be here, sorry, but um, uh, kind of sick. So we're here honoring this book for the writer, Alexander Shield. Shield. We first met was at the 150 drumming and singing in Vancouver where the, on Georgia Street, right across from Queen Elizabeth. We all sang there, my family. My, sister, my older sister set that up. And where was our territory? Lake Olot had a longhouse at Lumberman's Arch. In Stanley Park, and they're over here at Kitsilano, and up in Squamish, the Squamish River at 28 kilometers, 29 kilometers. They canoed up that way. That's how we traveled years, years ago. Travel from here, come down here for winter, go up there for summer. And that was our playground. Now we play grounds over here across the water at Homolchus in uh, Capilano. That's where we live now. But now we're all growing up. We all big family we had. She had 17 kids. And her son had 16, 16 kids, two sets of twins. And our father had 16 kids. And I'm the youngest boy out of this family. And I watch over my sisters. I protect them. I teach what I can, and I've been leading like our fathers and grandfathers did before, all the ceremonies like this, <clears throat> and our cousins. They lived right across the street from us over there at Humboldt's in Village. Because our house was the only one across the street, across the tracks the train tracks at Hamaltis and Village. We moved out of that beach in 67, moved up 
find an international plaza. We lived there since 67. And we only had a two-bedroom house with 16 of us. And all that. My mom did a lot of work. And my grandmother did um, basket weaving, beading, making blankets out of mountain goat and dog. Shayla's dog, right? Yeah. The Shayla's dog used to roam our mountains here years, years ago. Now there ain't no more. Um, so that we still have mountain goat up there. And he made a, she made a blanket for Sutlock, her husband, to go to England in 1906. And now it's, it's just still the fish center. It's kind of uh, traveling. traveling. So it's traveling. Still traveling. <laughs> without us. <laughs> you know what? We have that. We had a, a ceremony up there in Whistler at the Little Wet Squamish Culture Center. And we had totem poles that my grandfather made. You know, all of us were artists. The grandfather, great grandfather, fa grandfather, father, son, brothers. Now we're still keeping on that tradition of artwork. And my sister does these uh, beautiful regalia they made themselves. And how we, we just keep going forward with the teachings, what they taught us. And you know, she's, she was a strong woman. She always canoed from Squamish to here. She even made a silent movie that's called In the Land of Headhunters. And she was, they call her the Prince, Prince of Peace Lady the Squamish. She made a, a big potlatch at Potlatch Creek. It lasted for three to four months for every tribe around us. Every tribe around us, she made that. And we're the Squamish was the last one to drum and sing for that whole potlatch to stop the wars. And after that, she, she did a, an amalgamation, an amalgamation for all of us tribes around here. She started that and she passed, and my grandfather, Kutzla, finished it in 1923, three years after she passed. Now it's still out there, it's doing strong, and we protect that, and we're going further. But, you know, I can't wait to read this book, yes. more knowledge. More knowledge, so, so we can do the stuff she could probably do. And we're going to make that clean journey. And I thank you all for being here for this big opening. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my ancestral name is Yeltsin Illowit, and I'm the youngest daughter of the late Chief Simon Baker, Kotlacha Siam. And I just wanted to thank the Matthias family for inviting me because my dad was sent to Mary Capilano when he was two years old, and she raised him. And his mom was Susan Joel. So we've always been a very close family, and we're very, and there's 
a lot of bakers around. <laughs> all connected. I'd also like to acknowledge my oldest daughter, Candace, who has listened to her grandpa, who passed away when he was 90, but she's learned a lot of his teachings and is carrying them on. And I think that in a time of truth and reconciliation, I'm so proud of my family here that we're standing strong still and moving forward. And I'm really looking forward to reading the book. So thank you. territories of the Hulkamenum speaking Sweeney First Nation located across the Salish Sea from us here in Vancouver. I also happen to be the editor of the book that we are celebrating tonight, Legends of the Capilano. Now, thank you. Um, before I start talking a little bit about the book, I'd like to begin by expressing my deepest gratitude to the Matthias family for being here, for sharing in this important celebration alongside me. It really means the world to me to share this night with you. And um, so I am gonna now present the family with their long-awaited copies of the books um, and also with a bundle of tobacco. So I prepared these bundles of tobacco um, reflecting on all of the hard work that we have put into this book since we first met in 2017, can you believe it? Um, honoring the relationships that we have made along this journey, um, and also thinking about all of the good work that still will come, I hope, as a result of this book, um, with hopes that this book will bring people together in conversation and in relationship. So I'm going to do that now. Legends of Vancouver is 
Um, the title of the book that uh, this collection has had since 1911. So it was first published in 1911, over 100 years ago. Legends is a collection of 15 short stories or legends. And these were written by Mohawk writer, performer, poet, E. Pauline Johnson. Now most of the legends in that collection are based on the oral stories told to her by Squamish storytellers, Chief Joe Capuano and Mary Agnes Capuano. So Johnson, pictured here on the left, was a 20th century poet, performer, and writer, and she came from Six Nations territory near Brantford, Ontario. She became known for her writing during the 1880s and published often in Canadian periodicals, newspapers for several decades, and then spent most of her, her life up to her kind of um, late 40s, early 50s, traveling around Canada, the United States, even across the pond to England where she recited poetry. She was known kind of famously um, in her performances for gesturing towards her mixed Mohawk and English background. So she would appear for one part of the performance dressed in a buckskin uh, dress and then change uh, partway through the performance into a very European looking dress. She retired from the stage in 1909 and then moved here to Vancouver, where she spent her final years. Now, many of the stories that were published later in Johnson's life are based on her friendship with Joe Capilano, pictured in the middle here, and Mary Agnes Capilano. So she first met Joe Capilano in London in 1906, and she was there to perform, and Joe Capilano was there to meet with King Edward VII to protest restrictions being enforced over Indigenous land and fishing rights here in North America. Now, several years later, back in Vancouver, they actually continued this friendship that they had started in London. So Johnson would spend time with Joe Capilano and his wife, Mary Agnes, going on walks around North Vancouver, canoeing around the Burr Inlet, over to Stanley Park. And it was during these outings that the Capilanos shared some of their traditional stories with Johnson. And this was in a mix of Chinook jargon, so a type of trade language, and also English. When Johnson became increasingly sick, from breast cancer. Her friends and supporters came together and they formed a group called the Pauline Johnson Trust. So this was a group of friends that then gathered together a selection of these stories that had been published in a local newspaper, the Vancouver province, and put them together to form what would become uh, Legends of Vancouver, the book. So the stories were published uh, with the intention that all of the proceeds would go towards helping her uh, medical bills, to help her with the costs of her uh, illness. And as you can see in this image on the right, there are so many different editions, versions of this book that have existed since 1911. So it's been in publication consistently for over 100 years, which is pretty amazing. Now, as a researcher, I first came across this book um, during the course in my master's degree at Dalhousie, so in Halifax. And as I continue to learn from this book um, and to learn about its very kind of unique publishing circumstances, the circumstances that led to this book being created, I also realized that there was a pattern in all of these previous editions where the storytelling contributions of Joe Capilano and of Mary Capilano had kind of been overlooked. They had been neglected. And so that is where I came to this project, this, this idea of working on something new, something that would change this narrative.
So just a couple examples of the types of things that I found. So pictured on the left here, um, though we know that the stories chosen for that, that 1911 book, Legends of Vancouver, came from the Vancouver Province newspaper, there were actually other versions of these stories that had been published at the same time. But they were published in a different periodical. This one was called Mother's Magazine, published in the United States. And these are stories that focus more on themes um, like motherhood, um, relationships between women, honoring women. So it was a very different um, readership than the stories that were published locally here in the province, narrated by Joe Capitano. So with most of the stories um, in this other periodical being narrated by Mary Capilano, it meant that um, in choosing only from the province newspaper to compile Legends of Vancouver, all of Mary's stories were not included. They were never included in Legends of Vancouver, and they have not been until now. And so you might think, well, why, why is it important to include a different version of the story? Even if that the key part of the legend stays the same, the opening and closing, the parts where we learn about who Mary Capilano was as a storyteller, as a narrator, all of that is missing if we don't get to read the story from her perspective. Um, another issue that I came across, uh, pictured on the right here, is that up until this point, the book has been published under the title, Legends of Vancouver, which happens not to be the title that Johnson uh, actually wanted for the book. So um, this is a letter, um, it's very hard to read from this far away, I know, but this is a letter from the McMaster University Archives that reveals that Johnson wanted the book to be called Legends of the Capilano. And that was a way to honor her friends and fellow storytellers who lived on the Capilano Reserve in North Vancouver. So that uh, little quotation on the side there reads, um, so this is a letter from Pauline's sister Evelyn, uh, written just shortly after Pauline's death in 1913. So Evelyn writes, the name Legends of Vancouver was given the book by the trustees of the fund in the hope that it would prove a better seller. My sister was greatly disappointed as she had called it Legends of the Capilano. So up until this point, the book has held that title, Legends of Vancouver. Uh, but now with this new edition, we can return uh, Johnson's intended title to the book that also does that extra work of reconnecting the stories to this community as well. So, what does this new edition offer and why does it matter? So again, retitling the book from Legends of Vancouver to Johnson's intended title, you'll notice that all of these names are listed alongside each other. They are all receiving credit as authors. This new edition also includes um, new information about Joe and Mary Capilano, so um, including um, biographical information, photographs, but also drawing on how the Matthias family remembers and has heard stories of both of these people you know, in their own family. So integrating insights um, from the Matthias family as well. This book includes five additional stories narrated by Mary Capilano. So these are the ones like the um, version from Mother's Magazine that were published around the same time but were not chosen for Legends of Vancouver. And so um, by virtue of not being included, kind of left her voice out of the book until now. This book also importantly has been produced in consultation and respectful collaboration with the Matthias family, who I am endlessly grateful to. Um, they have written a new foreword to the book. 
um, and have also contributed uh, various insights throughout the entire book, which is um, just amazing. Um, this book also includes interviews with Mohawk scholar Rick Montour and Squamish archaeologist uh, Rudy Reimer. So these are two Indigenous experts who, um, just as sort of a, a, a component at the back of the book, reflect on the legacy of Johnson, of the Capitolines, of these stories in their home communities. Um, and then finally, all royalties from the sale of this book are going to a great cause. So they're going to the Chief Joe Mathias BC Aboriginal Scholarship Fund. So I am not personally taking any royalties from the sale of this book. And uh, the fund um, is named after the late Chief Joe Mathias, so brother to the family members seated here. Um, and it supports First Nations students across BC who want to pursue their dreams of post-secondary education. So you can feel really, really great about purchasing a copy um, and that you're supporting the next generation of Indigenous voices. And just to sort of wrap up my portion here, some acknowledgements. Um, first, again, to the Matthias family. And the picture here is this lovely photograph of Aggie uh, from the trip that we took to the suspension bridge. Um, <laughs> um, so Aggie is the great granddaughter of Chief Joe and Mary Capilano. We had such a fun day at this exhibit. Um, and I just really want to thank you all for being so open and generous, opening your hearts and your homes to me and to this work. I've learned so much from all of you and have such deep respect and gratitude for all the work that you're doing in the community to uh, bring people together. So I raise my hands to you all. Thank you. I also would like to thank, of course, the University of Manitoba Press, the publisher of this book, who have worked with me very tirelessly over many years to make this book happen. Um, this book is part of a series called First Voices, First Texts, which is a really amazing publishing initiative that helps to recover Indigenous object stories and reconnect them to their own communities. So it's doing things very differently in the publishing industry. Thank you also to local Indigenous-owned bookstore, Massey Books, um, and the Massey Arts Society for organizing this event, supporting this book. Um, I'm so grateful to have your support. And thanks also to the Museum of Vancouver, our generous host. And now some of you may not know this, but it's actually very serendipitous for us to be gathered here for this event because in Johnson's final will, which was authorized only nine days before her death in 1913, she actually left many of her own personal possessions to the museum to be held in stewardship. Um, including her signature buckskin performance dress. So there's lots of good energy um, in this building with us. And there are also um, belongings of Mary Capilano here that are on display out in the hall as well. So everything feels like it's coming uh, full circle. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank the funding organizations that helped support me during my PhD and those that support the important work that the University of Manitoba Press does to continue publishing books like this. Um, I look around the room and I am shocked at how many people are here. I wish that I could thank all of you individually and I hope that I will have the chance to later, but I want you all to know that I am so, so grateful for each and every one of you that you know, chose to be here tonight and um, that is supporting this important book. You know, um, no. um, and uh, I think at this point we have some time for some questions, if anyone has any questions, and then we're going to move to a, uh, a reading from the, the book um, by Mary Paul. Really good question. A long time. <laughs> um, so we started, we met in 2000.
2017. Um, the book has probably been through three big um, re revisions or re rewrites, um, and really been constantly working on it since since then. So it's been you know six years at least. Uh, but I also want to emphasize, you know, as a settler scholar, it's so important to take the time that you need to make these relationships happen in a natural way and over time so that, you know, there is trust and that um, you know that I'm accountable to you. Um, so it, it took the time that it took. Thank you. Yes? How did you come upon this project? So I, I first read a story from Legends of Vancouver in a class at uh, university, but it was such a strange experience because I grew up here, but these were stories that I did not know. And so it was um, like being kind of far from home at the time um, in Nova Scotia, coming across these stories, but then also thinking, there's so much going on in this book there's so much going on behind the scenes. And I just, my research brain clicked on and I just sort of, the rest was down a, a rabbit hole for many years. <laughs> yes. And so did, did the, that project itself bring you back to Vancouver from Nova Scotia to? I mean, in a way, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it brought me back here. And um, it's funny because I, I feel like during my my PhD, um, I was almost encouraged at times to not be so focused on this book, but really I just, I couldn't let it go. Um, there was just so many things that I felt like were an opportunity to do something differently, to make things right, to tell a different story, and um, I'm just glad that I was able to kind of, to stick with it and, and meet the Matthias family and that things just sort of over, time um, happened the way that they did. Thank you. Are there any other stories that didn't make the book that you may have learned of or due to, I don't know, uh, uh, restrictions or like, any kind? Of, <clears throat> like you said you added some more stories. I'm just wondering yes. if there was more than five new stories. <coughs> if no. there was a lot more. Not, not um, narrated by Mary Kaplan. Okay, yeah. No. So you just found the five and then out of those is extra? Yes. But, I mean, this is an issue um, quite common in Canadian publishing where Indigenous authors have had their works kind of mis misinterpreted, appropriated, um, that only now publishers are, you know, looking back and saying, you know what, this needs to be done in a different way. This wasn't handled correctly. We're at a point now where we need to make things right. So it is happening in, in many different um, circumstances beyond just this book, which is, I think, really important. Yeah. Yes. Was it easy to find the information in the archives, or were you on a wild goose chase across the country finding mm. things? Um. Well, with Pauline's information, there is information just across the street here at the City of Vancouver Archives um, at UBC at SFU, um, and I see um, Dr. Carol Gerson in the back there. Carol Gerson also has her own personal archive of many archival things because she is one of the um, experts on E. Pauline Johnson, so I am grateful to her uh, for all that she's generously shared with me over the years. Um, but that trip to McMaster where I um, found this letter was a really big trip anyway because I also at that time um, was working on a project relating to Métis author Maria Campbell's book Hathbreed and in the archives there I found pages that had been removed from her book without her permission um, and uh, so this um, trip kind of culminated in finding this you know what you feel like is like a smoking gun to retitle the book and to really make this project happen then also this other project that um, brought up a whole new relationship with um, with Maria Campbell as well. So, I mean, to answer your question, archival work is a lot of stumbling. 
um, and not knowing what you're going to find. But when you have kind of the motivation to, you know, make things right or to find that that uh, information that will help tell another story, it doesn't feel like work. asks if I had any inclination to pursue this work kind of in response to like the calls to action or to the, the concept of reconciliation. Um, I think not directly. It wasn't kind of like I, I knew of the TRC and then pursued this. It was more just a, a feeling that I couldn't shake that the story was not being told in the full way, or that perspectives had been deliberately left out, and that because of the, the work I can do as a researcher, that it felt like um, an opportunity for me to do something that would be meaningful, that would help change this narrative, and um, also, I guess, responds in some ways to this idea of that reconciliation, but is kind of just part of a bigger um, like following my heart way. under a different title called The Recluse. And in that original edition, it was narrated only by Joe Castellano. So this new version found in the um, Mother's Magazine periodicals is one that tells from the perspective of both Castellano. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is an entity of its own. I speak of love, great love, the love of pain, loss, self-sacrifice, love so deep it engulfs the heart. The heart's beat, the heart's beats harder and harder. The heart is full and grown, pressurizing the chest. Do you know love? I hope you do, I pray you do. For love like this requires, no, it demands strength. Mary knew this love, suck luck too. I feel this, I know this truth. I can hear it in their words. Maybe you can too. I read you Love's Truth, The Legends of the Squamish Twins. Um, the most dulcet of music was lulling me into drowsiness. The liquid, lovely, cadence of the mountain waters curling and singing about the beaches and innumerable rocks and boulders. Beyond the shade of the clustering boughless firs wherein I search to drum, search to dream and listen, the yellow August sunshine fell in a shower of gold encircling all were purple peaks of the majestic range of the mountains that swept down the Pacific coast like an imperial army outflung guard westward portals of the continent. The handsome Squamish chief had sat in silence for a full hour, a few feet from where I lounged. His wife was amusing herself, 
casting for salmon in the Reckling, in the Rolicking stream, and had been rewarded with some success. Several gleaming beauties lay there on the shore, their indecisive scales flashing back the sunlight, their firm bodies promising a delicious supper hours hence. What is that you see, Chief? I ask for his usual shrewd and twinkling eyes had grown brutishly melancholy. I see dead faces, hear dead voices, listen to the dead legends, he replied dreamily. The legends at least will live again if you tell them to me, I suggested with a, some craft. You shall hear them then, he, he answered graciously for he ever loved to desire, he ever loved my desire to know of his people, for we are of the same color, this Squamish chief and I, though not the same tribe or race, but the cock color. Oh, it makes us cousins in heart. He broke abruptly into his subject. Do you have much among, you have been much among the pale faces. What do they say of twins, twin children, he asked. Oh, twins, I said, rather startled at the odd question. Why, the pale faces like them. They are, they are well, very proud of having twins. I, I stammered heartily, sure of my, hardly sure of my ground. He laughed derisively. And the people of the east, of the land beyond the Great Lakes, do they ever give welcome to twins? His tones were half mocking, half fearful of my reply. I smiled, shaking my head. No red face ever does, I answered. Now we understand each other, he said with an evident relief. But what did, what say your tribe to this twins? No good, I admitted, dropping to his own fashion of broken English. We Iroquois count twins undesirable, almost a disgrace. We say they are as rabbits. Tawanda Naga, excuse my very <laughs> non-speaking um, language. Their parents are called, that is Mohawk, of rabbit. Is that all, he asked, his eyes and voice very solemn. That is all, I replied. Is it not enough? He shook his head. No, with us of the sunset tribes, he said, twins and no disgrace here only fear something, a warning of coming evil to the father, to the father of the tribe, but not disgrace. Won't you tell me of it, both of you, I, I added, for Mrs. Chief began to put her fishing rod, for Mrs. Chief began to put up her fishing rod. At the words twins, her eyes lost their interest in the stream. Her hand went lax and inherent in holding the rod she, for, she forthwith climbed across the boulders and seated herself close to me wordlessly, but I knew she had much to tell. So from them both I extracted this tale. I, can, I cannot hope to repeat in the fascinating dialect they had uttered, but I always hear mingled with their dulcet voices the rippling of the mountain stream when I think of the Squamish legend. It was a gray morning when they, when they told him of this disaster had fallen upon him. He was a great chief. He ruled over many tribe on the North Pacific coast. But now availed his, but now availed his greatness. His young wife had be, had borne him twins, and she was now sobbing in anguish. The little fur in her little fur bark teepee near the tide water. Beyond the doorway gathered many old men and women, old in years and wisdom and lore of their nations. Their hushed voices discussed the awesome thing, and for hours their grave counsel was broken only by the infant sobs of the two babies in the teepee. Something dire will happen to him, grieved the young mother. To him, my husband, the father of my boys. And outside, the men and women echoed, something dire will happen to him. And in Ancient medicine man arose, lifting his outreached palms to hush the lamenting throng. His voice shook with the weight of many winters, but his eyes were yet keen and mirrored the clear thought and brain behind them. And his 
words rolled forth in a certain mastery that no one essayed to dispute. It is the olden law of the Squamish that less evil befall the father because of his being the sire of twins. He go afar and alone into the mountains, fastest. There he may, I, there by his isolation and his loneliness to prove himself stronger than the threatened evil and thus to beat back the shadow that would otherwise follow him. I therefore name for him the length of days which he must spend alone, fighting this inevitable enemy, invisible enemy. He must leave this hour, take with him only his trustworthy bows, his fleetest arrows, and going up into the mountain wilderness, remain there 10 days alone. The masterful voice ceased, the tribe wailed in their ascent. The father arose speechless, his drawn face revealing the great agony over the seemingly brief banishment. He took leave of his sobbing wife of the two tiny souls that were his sons, grasped his fastest bows and arrows, and faced the forest like a warrior. But at the end of the ten days, he did not return. Not yet ten weeks not yet 10 months. He is dead, but the mother into the baby ears of her tiny voice. He could not battle against the evil that threatened. It was stronger than he. He so strong and brave and proud, he is dead. He is dead, echoed the tribesmen and the tribeswomen. Our strong, proud, brave chief, he is dead. So they mourned the long year through, but their chants and their tears were unanswered. Meanwhile, far up the Capilano Canyon, the banished chief had made his solitary home. For who, who can tell what fatal trick or sound that current of air, what faltering expression had deceived his alert Indian ears? But some unhappy fate had made him understand that his solitude must be of 10 years. 10 years duration, not 10 days. And he had accepted the mandate with the heroism of a stoic. For he, for he refused to, for had he refused to do so, his belief was that the threatened evil would be spared him, but would fall upon his tribe. Thus was one more added to the long list of souls who created has been. It is fitting that the one should suffer for the people. With his hunting knife, the banished Squamish chief stripped the bark from the gigantic firs and cedars building for himself a lodge beside the Capilano River, where leaping salmon could be speared by arrowheads fastened to the daftly shaped long handles. All through the fishing season, he lay by for the winter, smoking and drying the firm pink salmon with the care of a housewife. The mountain sheep and the goats, and even the great cinnamon and grizzly bears fell before his unerring arrows until they until their smoked hands and saddles hung in rows from the cross poles of his bark lodge. And their magnificent pelts carpeted his floor, hung in his walls, padded his bed and his clothes and his body. He made leggings, moccasins, and shirts from stitching them together with deer sinew. He gathered the brilliant scarlet salmon berries, their acid flavors gave a grateful change from the meat, from the meat and the fish. Month by month and year by year, he sat beside his lonely campfire, waiting, waiting for his long term of solitude to end. And then one hot summer day, the Thunderbird came, crashing through the mountains above him. Up from the arms of the Pacific rolled the storm cloud, and the Thunderbird, with its eyes of flashing light, beat its huge, vibrating wings on the crack and canyon. It should be said here that the Thunderbird was known to create storms. Upstream, a tall shaft of granite reared its needle-like length. It's named Thunder Rock, and the wise men of the pale Face people say it is rich of ore, copper, silver, and gold. At the base of this shaft, the Squamish chief crouched when the storm cloud broke and bellowed through the range. On its summit, the Thunderbird perched its gigantic wings, thrashing the air into the booming sounds, into splitting terrors like a Douglas pine crashing down the mountainside. But when the beating of those black pinions ceased and the echoes of the thunder 
waves died down the depths of the canyon, the Squamish chief arose, a new man. The shadow on his soul had lifted. The fears of threatening evil were cowed and conquered. In his brain, his blood, his veins, his sinew, he felt that the poisons of the melancholy dwelt no more. He had fulfilled the demands of the law of the Red Nations. As he heard the last beat of the Thunderbird's wings dying slowly, slowly fainting, faintly among the cracks, he knew he knew the bird too was dying, for its soul was leaving its monstrous black body, and presently appeared in the sky. He could see its arching overhead before it took a long journey to the happy ground, happy hunting grounds, for the soul of the Thunderbird was a radiant half circle of glorious color spanning from peak to peak. He lifted his head then, for his long banishment was ended. But down in the side, but down in the tide water country, the little brown faced twins were growing towards questioning age that most children do, whether red or white, are sure to reach that widening intelligence of big boyhood. All through the years he they asked, have we have we no father? as other boys have, and were met with the silent lips and shaking heads and the oft-repeated oft reply, your father is no more, your father the great chief is dead. But the son, but some flail in intuition told the twins that their sire would yet return, but when they would say this to their side-eyed mother, she would only weep and reply, that not even the witch, not even the witchcraft of the old medicine man could restore him to them. Then came the time when they would be ten years old. One week before their birthday, the two children stood hand in hand before their mother. Upon their slender shoulders, they strapped food for a long journey. Their bows, their arrows, their little hunting knives, their salmon spears. We go find our father, they said simply. What use? What use to protest? They were as young gods, and in their eyes was fire of purpose. Oh, useless quest, wailed the mother. Oh, useless quest, wailed the men and women. But the two children went forth into the forest, following upstream to the source of laughing, laughing Capilano River. For many days, their young faces flew through the shod with wings. No rocks, no boulders, no heights, no depths discouraged them. And when the sun arose on the morning of their tenth birthday, they too arose from the bright night's sleep, and far upstream they beheld a thin blue curl of smoke drift, drifting above a fir bark roof. It is our father's lodge, they said to each other, for their little Indian hearts were unerring in response to the call of kinship. Hand in hand they approached and entered the lodge, said but one word, Come, the great Squamish chief outstretched his arms towards them, then towards the Laughing River and the and towards the mountain tracks, my canyons, and with the child clinging to each hand, he faced once more the count, the county of the Tidewater. And when all the tribes, when all the tribe made welcome to him, one mighty potlatch, a great feast, his happy wife had but one, but these words to say: It was the children's hearts that led them to you. The legend was ended. For a long time, the chief and his wife and I sat beneath the same pines beside the morning river, murmuring river, sat silent and motionless with our thoughts wrapped in the long ago. Then the chief spoke. It was here where we are sitting that he built his fir bark lodge. Those many hundred years ago, here on this spot, he dwelt those 10 long years alone. Then he arose. It is getting, it is growing late, he said regretfully. The mountain airs at night are cool. The legend is ended. I knew he meant it was time for us all to return citywards. So like the older Squamish chief, I too arose and with outstretched arms said, goodbye my mountains, my brothers, my cracks, and my canyons.